You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is episode 31, covering the week of June 13th through June 17th, 2016. I'm Brian McClanahan, your host. Glad to have you back on the program. We had a lot of good material this week, uh, some very interesting articles that I think that you would find enjoyable that we'll discuss. Uh, some housekeeping again. Uh, our next conference is August 13th, 2016 in Atlanta, Georgia. Details are on our website. The topic is nullification. And uh, we're going to be running, as I said in the last podcast, several uh, pieces on nullification moving forward to try to get you in the spirit of the conference. And so we can discuss that particular issue. Also, don't forget that uh, the Abbeville Institute exists on your generous contributions alone. So please consider a tax-deductible donation. You can find all the information on that on our website, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the website, you'll see a place for uh, memberships and support. Uh, like us on Facebook. Like us, uh, you know, follow us on Twitter. Uh, follow our YouTube channel. We have a tremendous amount of material for your uh, consumption on the website. We have audio files. Our YouTube channel has video uh, of our conferences. We have, of course, all the reading material that we discuss. We also have the James McClellan Library, which is a great resource of primary documents. There's over 100 there on state power and federalism. Uh, James McClellan was one of the founding members of the Institute and uh, a, a great scholar on the American political tradition. So check that out as well. Tremendous amount of material out there for you to become educated on what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And I think that is the key to understanding our current mess in the United States. So without uh, further ado, let's talk about the articles for the week. On Monday, uh, we ran an article by yours truly entitled Silent Cal in the War. Now, uh, Right now, it would be you would be hard pressed to find many politicians, particularly in the general government, and absolutely in the executive branch, who would be willing to stand near a Confederate battle flag or any Southern symbol of that nature. But it wasn't always the case. It wasn't always the case that uh, presidents were afraid of this particular symbol. And you can go back, particularly in the early 20th century, even into the middle of the 20th century. There's pictures of uh, John F. Kennedy with Confederate battle flags. And, uh, you know, you find that. Uh, there's, a, there's an image of Bill Clinton um, from the 19, uh, 1992 campaign, Clinton Gore on a Confederate battle flag. I mean, this is, uh, this, you know, Howard Dean at one point saying, I want to be the guy that uh, that represents the, the, the guy with the uh, Confederate battle flag in the back of his pickup truck. You know, it wasn't that long ago that people still said, hey, I want to represent those people. I want to re represent those Southerners that believe in that. Now it's, I want to be the guy that takes all that stuff away and tears it all down. And, of course, last week we talked about a couple of uh, pieces on that particular topic. And we've done a lot with that in our PC attack on the South and our conferences. But in the early 20th century, you, you found presidents, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Calvin Coolidge, Warren Harding, uh, even Franklin Roosevelt. You found presidents that were more than willing, in fact, found it very acceptable to stand with Southerners in these particular symbols. And the piece that... I'm discussing actually has a photograph from the Library of Congress in front of the White House where Calvin Coolidge is standing with a group of Confederate veterans and they're holding up battle flags. And this picture was taken in 1927 and it was uh, taken because these battle flags were being returned to these Confederate soldiers. They were confiscated during the war and now they're being returned. And here you have Calvin Coolidge standing right in the middle of this. Uh, and at the White House. I mean, so I mean, who would do this now? Uh, it would be something that uh, every president would shy away from, but it, it wasn't always the case. And of course, people, uh, I've seen this picture used uh, on other websites saying, oh, 
This shows how insensitive Calvin Coolidge was, how stupid he was to believe in the lost cause. Oh, the lost cause. So, I mean, this is what you have, you know, these, these uh, hysterics of people who would be more than happy to see all Confederate symbols just thrown away, burned, destroyed, uh, because that's some, you know, some kind of relic of, of insensitivity and hate. Uh, and it's just amazing how far we've come. Now, Coolidge made two very interesting speeches in 1924 at Arlington. Now, for those of you that don't know, there is actually a Confederate memorial at Arlington. And, of course, this has uh, been in the news because the U.S. Congress has passed a bill greatly restricting the use of uh, Confederate symbols in national cemeteries. You can, on, on particular days, according to this legislation, go out and place a small battle flag on a grave uh, but otherwise, from what I understand, that you can still do that. But otherwise, uh, any other display of, of Confederate symbols is now illegal. And um, there was actually an interesting piece, uh, and I think it was in C uh, somebody wrote for CNN uh, this past uh, a couple of days ago, talking about how Robert E. Lee would have even been in favor of that legislation because he considered it divisive. But if you read the the actual quotes and you read them in context... That's not what he's saying. He's saying at the time he doesn't think that people should be spending money on monuments when the southern economy is in shambles and they have none. Uh, and then there's a great stretch made. You know, well, Lee said even years later that uh, he wasn't in favor of, uh, of attending some type of memorial because, and that just, ins that you can insinuate then that he never was in favor of any of these things. Lee had decided, and again, that's taking Lee out of context, Lee had decided that he was going to lead a very private life because he didn't want to make any money or uh, have any uh, emoluments off of his status, his, his fame. He didn't want to use that in any way other than just being a private family man anymore. So Lee shied away from almost every public appearance after the war in any way. So you, you'd, have to go, you'd have to stretch the point where you'd say, well, Lee was not in favor of any of these things. In 1866, he wasn't. He wasn't in favor of it because he was afraid of reprisals if people were still proud of the fact that their fathers, brothers, sons had served in the Confederate Army and bled and died or were wounded. And Coolidge and Teddy Roosevelt, you know, remember Teddy Roosevelt's mother was a proud, unreconstructed Southerner. And uh, they were very well aware that a large percentage of the Southern population, well, particularly in 1924, uh, was very much in favor of these symbols because it represented their past and their ancestors. It represented the people that they loved, their grandfathers. And they were concerned that uh, North and South, that these things were going to be demonized and that they had to be respected. And that's why you saw people giving pennies, and as Kerry Roberts has pointed out in one of our presentations on this topic, literally pennies to try to build these Confederate memorials without any malice or hate in their heart. That's not what they were built for. They were built out of love and respect for the cause which they gladly displayed on the monuments what that cause was, and as they said in Columbus, Georgia, to perpetuate forever the sovereignty of the states, that was the idea, the cause for which they fought. So uh, Coolidge was well aware of this, and so in these two speeches, he emphasized, you know, Coolidge was from Vermont. He was a Puritan, uh, and uh, bred on New England, as I said, bred on New England history and sensibilities, but he viewed American history as a complex quilt of interpretations woven together in a union of common interests. And so he begins, for, he gave two addresses, one at the Confederate Memorial itself, and then one just a few days later in Arlington overall. And he begins this speech at the Confederate Memorial with this particular topic and this particular statement, quote, If I am correctly informed by history, it is fitting that the Sabbath should be your Memorial Day. Your, meaning Southerners, your Memorial Day, the Confederate Memorial Day. Now, of course, Confederate Memorial Day is in uh, April, uh, but some others celebrate it in May. 
He says, quote, this follows from the belief that except for the forces of Oliver Cromwell, no army was ever more thoroughly religious than that which followed General Lee. And I'll get into this in another two other particular presentations, uh, uh, articles this week as well. Moreover, these ceremonies necessarily are expressive of a hope and a belief that rise above the things of this life. It was Lincoln who pointed out that both sides prayed to the same God. We'll hear that again in another article. When that, is, when that is the case, it is only a matter of time when each will seek a common end. We can now see clearly that what that end is. It is the maintenance of our American form of government, of our American institutions, of our American ideals beneath a common flag under the blessings of Almighty God. He continues. Now he's speaking about Confederate soldiers and Union soldiers together. It was for this purpose that our nation was brought forth. Our whole course of history has been proceeding in that direction. Out of a common experience, made more enduring by a common sacrifice, we have reached a common conviction. On this day, we pause in memory of those who made their sacrifice in one way, Southerners. In a few days, we shall pause again in memory of those who made their sacrifice in another way, Northerners. But here is the key, quote, they were all Americans, all contending for what they believed were their rights. On many a battlefield they slept side by side, here in a place set aside for the resting place of those who have performed military duty. Both make a final bivouac, but their country lives. He goes on, Your country respects you for cherishing the memory of those who wore the gray. You respect others who cherish the memory of those who wore the blue. In that mutual respect, may there be a firmer friendship, a stronger and more glorious union. How many presidents would say that? And he concludes this very short, this very short speech. But America claims them all. America claims them all not to relegate as traitors, not to, not to put into the dustbin of history to tear down things. America, he says, all Americans, Calvin Coolidge from Vermont claims them all. Her flag floats over them all. Her government protects them all. I don't see that happening today. It only protects some at the expense of others. And Coolidge, of course... And to say, well, Coolidge is just a, and I've seen this somewhere else too, Coolidge is just a lost cause neo-Confederate. I mean, my gosh, how silly. Coolidge made a number of speeches uh, in favor of all people in the United States. I've actually ranked Coolidge as one of my four best presidents and nine presidents who screwed up America. He's one of the four that tried to save America. He was concerned about all of America in 1924 and representing everyone, white Southerners and black Southerners. White Northerners and Black Northerners. What you have now, when you have Howard Dean saying, I want to represent that guy with the Confederate flag, that's what he's saying. So, you know, this is what Jim Webb is saying currently when he says, look, I want to represent that, that flag it, is not a problem. I want to represent those people that believe in that. Uh, there used to be a time when those on the left would actually say these type of things. And even on the right now, you had a number of Republicans, uh, if they're qu supposedly on the right, uh, vote for this bill to remove these symbols from national cemeteries. Again, uh, this is just cultural purging uh, and something that for years would never even have been countenanced for one minute. But yet... Now we have people writing articles saying Robert E. Lee would have supported this cultural purging. I mean, my gosh, this guy would have. I mean, it's just so silly. And then on May 30th, just five days later in 1924, he, wrote, he, he said this. We meet again on, upon this hollowed ground to commemorate those who played their part in a particular outbreak of an age-old conflict. Many men have theories about the struggle that went on from 1861 to 1865. Some say it had for its purpose the abolition of slavery. President Lincoln did not consider, so consider it. There were those in the South who would have been willing to wage war for its continuation, 
but I very much doubt if the South as a whole could have been persuaded to take up arms for that purpose. There were those in the North who had been willing to wage war for its abolition, but the North as a whole could not have been persuaded to take up arms for that purpose. President Lincoln made it perfectly clear that his effort was to save the Union, with slavery if you could save it that way, without slavery if you could save it that way. But he would save the Union. The South stood for the principle of the sovereignty of the states. The North stood for the principle of, of the supremacy of the Union. If anyone said that today, <laughs> uh, they would be branded a neo-Confederate. It's just silly uh, how far we've come in 100 years. Less than 100 years. Uh, so these are, I, I, we, we put the, I placed both uh, full text of the speech in this piece so you can read the whole thing. They're, they're very good. And again, something you would not hear from a modern politician. On Tuesday, we ran a piece entitled The Theology of Secession by M.E. Bradford. And this gets back to some of the things I was just mentioning about Lee and what Coolidge said about the religious nature of the Southern Army. And what Bradford does here very well, and what another piece is going to do this week as well, is explain one of the differences between North and South, at least the way Southerners saw it in 1861. And that was, uh, as Bradford says, Southerners had, by the time they left the Union, serious doubts about what kind of country the United States was about to become. It was not only what the Yankees were attempting to do to the South, but even more important, what they were doing to themselves, which made the moral and intellectual leaders of our region doubt whether they wished to leave their children in any political or moral connection with the modern uh, power state emerging above the old surveyor's line. In the North was a regime whose primary faith was in the human will and intellect in the ability of man through science and politics to subdue the entire creation and reshape it according to his fondest dreams. The political form of this culture was that of a juggernaut, embodying a radical spirit which, according to Admiral Raphael Semmes, quote, seemed to be now what it had been in the great French Revolution, a sort of mad dog virus making rabid all who were touched by it. What Southerners were seeing, this is me speaking now, what Southerners were seeing at this time was that they were defending Christianity from all the innovations that the North was trying to push forward. Uh, and Bradford quotes Weaver when he says, this was the, the South was the last non-materialist civilization in the Western world. And many soldiers were baptized during the war. They converted while under arms. Braxton Bragg, Joseph E. Johnston, William Hardy, Dick Ewell, John B. Hood. And maybe 150,000 other soldiers were converted to Christianity while they were under arms. It was not just Stonewall Jackson or Robert E. Lee, both Christian gentlemen, but thousands of other men who went through the same conversion. Now, Bradford goes on to say, he says, quote, As I noted earlier, almost to a man, the religious leaders of antebellum Southern society called for secession and led the way in reconciling the people of the South to all the hardships secession would cost them taught them that the separation of the North was a holy enterprise. And in numberless sermons and religious publications, they explained their attitudes with commentary on what was wrong with Northern religion. Uh, this is why Stanton was willing to replace Southern ministers with Northern ones during the war, which, I mean, my gosh, that is a complete violation. If these states are still in the Union, that's a complete violation of the First Amendment. The Reverend James A. Duncan declared that his northern counterparts were, quote, advocates of every semi-infidel notion which could be stated.
And so this went on and on. Uh, we could talk about, and, and Eugene Genovese has done very well with this, the religious backing of the Confederate Army and the religious backing of Confederate or Southern resistance to modernity. As a piece in DeBose Review put it, as Brad, uh, Bradford quotes, every bloody revolution in Christendom, as well as in church as in state, for the last 300 years has been brought about by following the too often deceptive guide of reason. As John Dickinson said in 1787, experience must be our only guide. Reason may mislead us. Uh, and Bradford uh, Bradford quotes a very interesting uh, time in the war. And, of course, everyone's familiar with the Rebel Yale. But uh, it wasn't just that that Southerners went into battle doing. And there was, uh, in 1864, a, a Reverend S.M. Cherry from Georgia wrote this. About the fifth instant, the soldiers were called from their camps to meet the enemy in the vicinity of Oakton. They literally went from the altar to their entrenchments, from their knees to the battle with their foes, still singing the songs of Zion and supplicating the throne of grace as they, sur as they surrounded the fires of the bivouac or waited to receive the fire of their foe. And then he quotes... Um, Uh, that in 1864, uh, many Southerners were called to battle essentially by a religious zeal. And Bradford says, in such fierce and lovely moments, a solid South, the buried nation of our ancestors, was born. For in defeat and the bondage of enemy occupation, Southerners could think of themselves as a people called out to a special witness, a righteous nation surviving in the midst of modernity, sealed forever in its covenant by defeat and freedom from the besetting ambitions of the victorious progressive North. And he says, quote, The consequences of their admonition are still among us, setting most Southerners aside from the primary delusions of our place and time. Historians who wish to understand Southern persistence and character would do well con to consider this evidence and be less concerned with the explanations of Southern particularly which derive from slavery alone. And this is a question. Did slavery make Southern culture? Or was there something deeper to it? Now, I mean, if you look at, say, Drew Gilpin Faust, and she had said in Confederate the creation of Confederate nationalism that it was all race and slavery that made the Southern nation. That didn't exist otherwise. And I think there's plenty of evidence from many historians, uh, many of whom would not be considered Southern partisans, to say that it was something deeper than that. Uh, Daniel Borst, uh, Borston uh, wrote that uh, cavalier culture made society, that you know slavery was brought about because of that. Uh, the same thing that David Hackett Fisher said in his Albion Seed. Um, so the question about Southern culture, it wasn't created by slavery or race. It was something deeper than that. It was created by something else. Uh, culture was something that was rooted all the way back in England. And um, many people have said that, but I think the modern hysteria forgets that. There is something true and valuable in Southern culture uh, and, Southern, and, and the Southern people beyond slavery and race. And that's what we do at the Institute. We try to find those things. It's the resistance to modernity in whatever form that can find currency today. All right. On Wednesday, uh, we ran a piece uh, by Clyde Wilson, Why They Hate Jefferson. So um, it's very good. And essentially, what th one thing the Institute does is pursue the Jeffersonian tradition 
of political self-determination. And essentially, you know, Claude gets into this. He says, uh, quote, what a marathon of Jefferson bashing we have had in the last few years. And I wrote this piece in the late 90s. And he's reviewing a book uh, by Connor Cruz O'Brien, The Long Affair, Thomas Jefferson and the French Revolution. And um, he says, none of this current literature tells us anything about Jefferson. There is no scholarship. That is, research and discovery involved. We have here, rather, a case study in intellectual sociology. That is, an exhibit by fashionable intellectuals determining what is and is not acceptable to their version of the American regime. What they tell us is that Jefferson is out now. Clyde goes on to say, friends, you must, either ha- you must have either Jefferson or Hamilton. And he gets into the economy of the two and how we have either have a Jeffersonian America or a Hamiltonian America. Uh, and uh, he points out that the, the problem with Jefferson for most is that he was not an egalitarian like they are. And Clyde points out, well, neither was Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, or Harry Truman, or like Eisenhower. They weren't either. So what? And he says, quote, what we have here is elitist hysteria, an old and familiar phenomenon. During the election of 1800, the president of Yale, Timothy Dwight, who, by the way, was an ardent pro-slavery advocate, stumped New England trying, with the aid of most of the New England uh, clerisy, to convince the people that Jefferson was a representative of the Illuminati. John Adams cowered in his fortified house in fear of the mob while Jefferson lived at ease among his 200 slaves. The Federalists persuaded themselves that the guillotines were about to be set up if that horrible uh, decadent Southerner were elected, ousting them from their power and prestige. Today, we have merely the latest version of the thing. Petty elitists, unsure of their unmerited positions and fearful of the people, conjure up a dark spectacle of terror. How unthinkable that we should have those yahoos out there calling the shots instead of their betters. Um, There's, I don't even make the the connections, but I think that in 2016 you can see the political rhetoric that's being used against one particular candidate in this in this way. Clyde continues, the trouble is Jefferson was always a liberal, but never a liberal with a capital L. Liberals with a capital L for years perpetuated an elaborate hoax making Jefferson one of them, which he never was or could have been. Now that it is obvious that he really wasn't, An elaborate excommunication, equally a hoax from the American canon, seems to them necessary. It would be comedic if it were not such a malicious perversion of the historical truth. The burden of O'Brien's teaching is that Jefferson does not belong in and must be ejected from the American civil religion. But does America have a civil religion? Ought we to have one? Who says so? And if we do, do we need some damn foreigner to tell us what is to be left in and what out of it? What Jefferson most fundamentally signifies is that we do not need secular priests governing our civic life. We need merely to trust in a limited popular government while keeping a wary eye on the self-appointed clerisy. The pundits are right, Clyde concludes. Jefferson does not offer aid and comfort to the present regime, and let us thank the Creator who endowed us with our inalienable rights for that. We still have in Jefferson a powerful symbol for liberty and the consent of the people that no number of pettifogging scribblers can suppress. So it's an excellent piece, very short, but uh, well worth your time to explain why they hate Jefferson. Now, on Thursday we ran a piece by Brad Berzer, who is a professor at Hillsdale College, now, this piece was originally published at the imaginativeconservative.org, a great website. I highly recommend going over there and checking it out. Uh, Winston Elliott, who's a friend of the Institute, runs that uh, uh, particular publication. So uh, I'd highly recommend checking them out as well. And this piece is, uh, piece is entitled, What Lincoln's Election Meant to South Carolina. And what Dr. Berzer does here is bring up the same thing that Bradford was talking about, uh, in his last piece. And um, they talk about it was a religious zeal here. And so I'm going to read this first paragraph because it's really good. 
The finest of gentlemen founded South Carolina. Informants assured the famous London Times correspondent William R- Howard Russell upon his arrival in Charleston in April 1861, quote, It was established not by witch-burning Puritans, by p- cruel persecuting fanatics who implanted in the north the standard of Torgmadia, and breathed in the nostrils of their newly born colonies all the ferocity, bloodthirstiness, and rabid intolerance of the Inquisition, the South Carolinas assured him, shortly after the bombardment of Robert Anderson's band of astoundingly brave Union men at Fort Sumter. Confusing its own bigotry with Christianity, Puritanism had birthed, quote, impurity of mind among men and unchastity in women. Thoroughly enveloped the New England soul, the South, Carolina, South Carolinas continued. Evil, corrupt, and dark, Northerners might very well, quote, know how to read and write, but they don't know how to think. And they are the easy victims of the wretched impostors on all the ologies and isms who swarm over the, over the region. To, the, to a Southerner, the North seemed nothing short of decadent, its freedom not standing for anything but a loss of purpose and direction, its people confused, running in many directions, chasing nothing of import. The parties in this conflict are not merely abolitionists and slaveholders. They are atheists, socialists, communists, red republicans, Jacobins on the side, and the friends of order and regulated freedom on the other, a famous Southern theologian James Henley Thornwell had written. In one word, the world is the battleground. Christianity and atheism, the combatants, and the progress of humanity is at stake. Another South Carolina minister, Thomas Smythe, claimed the Yankees to be the Bible haters, anti-Christian levelers, and anarchists. If Puritanism had not caused enough trouble, its own holy allies, capitalism and immigration, had further corrupted the North. We don't want to risk our handsome, genteel, educated young fellows against a gang of Irishmen, Germans, British deserters, and New York roughs, not worth killing, and yet instructed to kill to the best advantage, a South Carolinian worried in January of 1861. We can't endure it, and we shan't do it. Perhaps independence would cost too much, they admitted. I would not fear so much were our troops to meet the fanatics of the North face to face, for we have truth, justice, and religion on our side and our homes to battle for, Miss Emma Holmes wrote in her diary in February 1861. But Fort Sumter is almost impregnable, and to take it, thousands of the best and bravest of Carolina's sons must be sacrificed. So, uh, Dr. Berzer gets into this particular piece, and what he's talking about is the fact that uh, Southerners were worried that a northern victory would mean uh, the South, as he quotes in this piece, would be reduced to a consolidated despotism. And it, they worried about that despotism because they saw in the North radicalism of all kinds. It wasn't just anti, anti-slavery fanatics, but it was fanaticism of all kinds. Socialism, feminism, all the isms and ologies as it says in the piece, that have plagued the United States today. Uh, It has been pointed out that when you lose Christianity, you naturally go to communism, because it's the only thing that makes sense. And so what Southerners were saying uh, is that this is the natural byproduct of what's going to happen. And I think you can see that. I mean, Southerners were saying over and over again, this has been uh, Southerners were saying over and over again, it wasn't just, it wouldn't stop with slavery, of course. You know, they were concerned about that. It wouldn't just stop with slavery. But it would add to it all the other isms, all the other things that we fear, because the North has lost religion. And so uh, what you have seen is that this has come true. You know, the other things that the North wanted overall, the other reform movements, have come, have come to pass. And we're living in that America. And so I think that um, when you dig deeper into this theological defense of secession, as Bradford points out, you get to that. You get to that. Now, uh so it's an excellent piece. I'd highly recommend it. It's, again, a brief survey of, of uh, the dichotomy, again, what Southerners saw as the dichotomy between the North and the South, which was religion and atheism. So uh, it's excellent to, uh, to think about that. And finally, the last piece of the week was entitled, My Son, Get Wisdom, Get Understanding, and it's by Thomas Cooper. Now, Thomas Cooper was 
the president of South Carolina College in the 1820s. And he made this speech. He was also an ardent nullifier. Uh, and he made, he made this speech in December of 1821 to the graduates of South Carolina. And every now and then it's nice to put something up that's a little change of pace. And that's what this is. It's a change of pace. Uh, but what he's, what he's doing here is, this is these are timeless words of wisdom to Southerners, or anyone, I mean, really, but since we're talking about the Southern tradition, it's to Southerners. He's speaking to Southerners in 1821. And uh, he, he says, Before you leave this institution finally, it becomes my duty in compliance with established custom to offer you a few words of parting advice, which I shall do with great plainness and sincerity, leaving the present and future effect of them to depend on their intrinsic value. I am perfectly aware that some of the opinions I am about to deliver will by no means meet your cordial approbation. Be it so, I am only solicitous to give you, fairly and honestly, the practical result of my own observation and long experience. The time was when I thought, as I presume you think now, the time will probably arrive when you also will adopt the sentiments I am about to deliver. Now, Cooper is often criticized for, uh, for becoming uh, an atheist. But here in 1821, he says, At first it is usual to exhort you strenuously to cultivate the religious part of your education and to bear in constant remembrance the obligations you are under and the duties you owe to Almighty God, your Creator, Preserver, and Benefactor. So he's saying you have to have religion. But then... He keeps going. He says, About as you are to plunge into the worldly the vortex of worldly pursuit, I have some general and some specific observations to offer to your consideration, trite perhaps, but not the less important. Our first and leading object on the road of life is to acquire by industrious and honorable pursuits a, a sufficient income to support ourselves and our families in reasonable comfort and to accumulate within reasonable bounds for the wants of old age and the claims of our offspring. It is seldom that this cannot be done by the exertions commonly used. Sometimes, indeed, the want of success arises from want of reasonable industry, but this is not often the case. And so he begins, this is, again, timeless. The failures that I've seen arose that are those that have arisen from want of keeping accounts, from carelessness of minute expenses, from anticipation of resources, and facility of incurring debt. I've seen enough in life to satisfy me that frugality is not merely a matter of prudence. It is a virtue of the first order. So this is getting back to the idea of modernity. Southerners being frugal, not, not embracing modernity or consumerism. The want of it, meaning frugality, is a more serious evil than the average of all the accidents and misfortunes of life put together. The habit of running in debt without seeing clearly the means of getting rid of it is productive of more misery, mental and bodily, than any other cause that I know of in the intercourse of society. I do not say that a poor man cannot be an honest man. Poverty is comparative. No man can be considered as really poor whose wants are within his income, however, however small this may be. But no man can be otherwise considered than, a, than as poor whose wants and expenses exceed his income, however large that may be. Debt is the parent of servility, of self-degradation, too often of vice. And he quotes Benjamin Franklin, It is hard for an empty purse to stand upright. Remember then, that although mirth and luxury and convivially may exist with debt, happiness never can. Convivalry, excuse me. Happiness never can. We often engage in convivalry at our Abbey Mill Institute events. So he goes on to say, is that the education that you have, you need to continue to learn. You will be destined, he says, to the pursuits of agriculture or commerce or manufacture or to the professions of law, physic, or divinity, and it is probable that you will, uh, will all become voluntarily politicians of various grades. And this is important. Here he is at South Carolina College, 
And these are the best men of society. And he's saying these men are going to lead. So these are the things you have to be able to do. First, get an income. And then for your family and yourself, for your old age, take care of yourself. This is independence. Don't run debt because you will not be independent that way. And when you get out into your trades, your education can help, but you need to continue to learn. As Al Suin noted, all the way back during the age of Charlemagne, ye lads who age is fitted for reading, learn. Don't waste these days. And that's all that Cooper is saying. If you're young and listening to this, learn. Don't waste the days. Don't waste, as Yasuin said, don't waste the teachable days in idleness. Learn something. Uh, there's a funny story. You know, Clyde Wilson used to call his graduate students and say, read, read, read. Read. Learn. And he gets into a long discussion of what you should be reading and how you should be reading. And that's a much of the uh, of the of the talk, and I think it's worthy to read that. Um, but it's the other advice that he gives that's very important. He says, among the early nations of antiquity, preserving democratic features in their form of government, oratory was much cultivated, because when books were scarce and newspapers unknown, it was from their orators that the people acquired a knowledge of public facts, both of external and internal relation. But the whole history of ancient oratory demonstrates that it was little else than the art of cheating the understandings of a uh, gapping populace by musing their imaginations and exciting their passions for the purpose of carrying some favorite measure of the moment. Sometimes the measure was a proper one, frequently the reverse. I hold all modern oratory in much of the same estimation. I cannot praise those who are skilled by the dexterous use of harmonious periods and assumed earnestness of manner to make the worse appear the better reason. So he's saying, don't listen to these dealers in oratory, because most of the time they're lying. So he also talks about in this particular speech, which I didn't get into, but um, that what you need to do is avoid, he, he, he's an ardent anti-tariff person, what you need to do is avoid uh, you know, schemes of government that enrich some at the expense of others. So I'd highly recommend you read this talk, the speech that he made to graduates in 1821. There's a lot of timeless wisdom here about things that you should be paying attention to. If you're a young man, a young woman out there getting out in the, in the road of life now, one thing that is never going to go away is you need to learn and read and follow the advice of the giants who were here before us. This is the Southern tradition. Understand that the South was an alternative. This is, you know, our summer school this, this past week was about the South and the renewal of Southern tradition and the renewal of America, what it can offer to America today. Not the things that are gone from it, that we're thankful are gone from it, but the things that are timeless in it. Independence, self-determination, religion, self-sacrifice, these are the things that last. These are the timeless things. And because of that, those are the things that the Abbeville Institute promotes, the Jeffersonian tradition of the Jeffersonian political tradition, the theological tradition, the conservative theological tradition that the South said they favored over the North, which by the 1860s was true. Those are the timeless things. These are things that Calvin Coolidge could recognize in 1924 that we can no longer recognize in 2016. So I implore you to go out and read and learn, as Cooper implored his graduates in 1821, be the best people in society. Be the top, because society needs it. Be the guides. 
Start thinking of yourself and your family first and be the, be the models for civilization moving forward. Don't give the other side ammunition to say that you're not educated or you're not aware of the past. You don't have to be wealthy, but you can be wealthy if you do things properly in life. Wealth is not just measured in money. As we had last week, dress appropriately. It's a form of resistance to the central, to the modern state. Uh, after that piece was published last week on how to dress, how and why to dress like a Southern conservative, uh, Dr. Wilson emailed me and said, you know, and pointed out that back in the 60s, people started wearing blue jeans of all statuses because that's what their communist brothers were doing over in Russia. It was a way to be the proletariat. Don't be that. Blue jeans have a place if you're working, but dress in a fashion that's conservative because that is a protest in and of itself of modern American society. If you do these things, if you exhibit self-independence, then it's only a matter of time before society will change in accordance with what other people are doing. But you have to be the leaders in this, not the followers. And if you can do that, the Southern tradition will still survive. Until next time, good day. Good day.